James Ernest, Ruin Truth Radio Network, here with the star of Flag Football the Movie, Sid Ziegler. Sid, uh, what sports did you play growing up? You know, I, uh, I ran track in, in cross country. I was a, a, a hurdler and a jumper uh, in track, and then a distance runner, obviously, in cross country. And, you know, I was, uh, I was, my, my, I was born with athletic genes, so I, w- I was pretty fast. What originally got you interested in flag football? You know, I came out in my personal life after I totally fell in love with this athlete um, that I met playing pickup ultimate frisbee at UCLA. And my introduction to the gay community was sports. I, I, that's how I met my first boyfriend. That's he's the one who uh, who who got me to come out, and he very early on introduced me to a couple of friends who ran a gay flag football league here in Los Angeles, and I, my introduction to the whole community was really immersing myself in gay flag football and and my boyfriend playing ultimate frisbee. So sports was part and parcel to me being gay very early on, this is in my early 20s, and, and you know, you you, uh, you meet a bunch of cool guys, and you're having fun running around, and you're winning and losing, and you're going out for drinks afterward, and it just becomes a part of you, so it really was the, 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 the fun social aspect of the Gay Flag Football League here in Los Angeles that got me hooked. Tell us a little bit about the uh, National Gay Football League, about how big has it gotten, um, how many teams, players, that kind of thing. Boy, so Jim Bozinski, uh is one of my best friends, and he uh, he co-founded Outsports with me, and the two of us co-founded uh, the Gay Bowl in 2002. We invited gay flag football teams from Boston and San Francisco, those were the only two that we knew of, to come to L.A. for a weekend of flag football, and we had a little uh, mini tournament with three teams. And that started an annual tradition of going to a different city the next year. We went to San Francisco and then to Boston and to Atlanta. And every year since, that has, that every fall, uh, there has been the Gable. And, and today, I mean, this, this past year, I think it was in Denver, and it was, I think there were 40 open, uh, open or men's teams and then another dozen or so women's teams. There are organizations in, I think, 22 to 25 different cities from Honolulu to Boston, South Florida. So it, it really is all over the country now, and it's, it's great. It's awesome to have watched it expand. I can imagine everyone has voted that Honolulu needs to host the next one. They are they are actually hosting the next one. So oh wow, <laughs> you, you, you hit the nail on the head. The next one or the or the year after, I can't remember which one, but Honolulu is uh, is going to be hosting in the next couple of years. Yeah, I figure that just seemed like a really fun place to go. Why not have it there? Yeah, yeah, I would love to take take credit saying, oh yeah, I did the research and I knew that, but no, that was a good <laughs> guess. Yeah, lucky guess. So uh, what challenges did you face in sports or because, like you said, it just seemed ingrained into the, uh, the process or ingrained into your life that there wasn't as many challenges as some of the other athletes that had faced? You know, uh, honestly, I don't think that there are many challenges today for for. For I'm going to say gay men in sports. You know, it's, I think that you talk about trans athletes, for example. I think they face very, very different, very real policy challenges and all kinds of things. But I think for for a lot of uh, gay men, bisexual men, and queer men in sports, you know, the challenges that we face. It's a lot of language issues. It's 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 uh, it's teammates and coaches saying really dumb things when they don't think anybody's around. When I was in high school, I remember being on a, a long run. We had a coach, cross country coach, who would run with us for our training runs. And I remember one day him launching into a couple of gay jokes, and and that kind of language it very subtly tells you you don't belong here if you're gay. But what we have found is that a lot of that language, the, the meaning that we take from it as as young gay athletes isn't the meaning that's intended. My coach never intended to, to make a gay 
athletes feel uncomfortable. And, and most athletes who say really dumb things in the locker room, they don't mean to make anyone comfortable. They're just being stupid and saying things that they've been automatically trained to say. So, you know, the, 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 I guess the quote-unquote challenges for me with some language issues. But other than that, uh, you know, I, the sports world has been uh, so open and welcoming for me. I played competitive ultimate frisbee at Stanford in college, and I played it as an adult. And I've, I've really never had an issue uh, beyond uh, really stupid language being thrown around. What message should people take away from the documentary? Well, I think there are a couple things. The, Seth Greenleaf, who produced and directed it, one of the things that he really wanted to convey, I believe, was just how good athletes, how strong, how competitive, how determined gay men can be in the sports world. And the stereotype of gay men is, is that we... Uh, we like Broadway show tunes and that we're weak and not competitive. Uh, and, and I think that one of the things that Seth is trying to do with the movie, and I think that he succeeded wildly, uh, is, is showing just how strong and determined uh, and athletic gay men can be. I mean, some of the, it's a very high level of flag football that gets played at these tournaments. There's a lot of contact is allowed. Where, which is not the case in a lot of flag football leagues. I mean, you can uh, a, a defender can get up on a receiver and, and really physically handle a receiver at the line of scrimmage in 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 the uh, NGF, the National Game Flag Football League. So, I think if you watch the movie, you're going to you're going to come away with it at least. Thinking that these these gay men uh, are these these are not just uh, some uh, random gay guys running around the field. These are real athletes. Yeah, I agree with you. That was one of the things that I was definitely impressed by. Is it seems just like you said, uh, the athleticism, the intensity, the competitive nature that the athletes showed in the uh, in the documentary. That yeah, like you said, it's not just about. Uh, about sexual orientation, it's about actually just getting out there and playing some real football. Yeah, and, and we have, you know, Seth, the director and producer, he was introduced to it. I, I remember meeting him on, uh, on a field in New York City when I was running the Gay Flag Football League, and we were training for the Gay Bowl. This is back, um, I was captain of the New York Warriors, and we were winning the Gay Bowl championships, and Seth was there. And he very quickly realized, oh, this is a really high level of football. This is fun. The way the rules are designed, it really, uh, it really um, promotes uh, just, just, just going out there and feeling as, as close to you as you can in flag football to playing real football. So we have a lot of straight men uh, who come and play in local gay flag football leagues because it's just a really great brand of flag football. Yeah, I was going to say, I was wondering about that, that uh, the rule, the 20% rule, do they still have that, or has it been modified? So in, in the local leagues, if, if you're looking to play flag football in, in one of the cities, uh, the, I don't think any of them have any rule about a team has to be X amount LGBT. You, they're open to everybody. When you get to the, the gay bowl, one, one of the problems is that, that, that many gay men face, if, if, if only in their own heads, is that they, they just don't feel comfortable uh, in, in sports. They don't feel comfortable in adult sports. They don't feel comfortable around uh, playing with straight men in sports. There's just uh, And if you go play in a straight league, it, it feels very different you know being around when you get a bunch of straight men together it feels very different from having a bunch of gay men together to protect the opportunities that lgbtq people have to play in the gay bowl the only rule uh, that exists today is that and this has been changed is that the majority of people on the field for a team at any time have to be lgbtq so it could be four and three five and two six and one seven and zero but it's designed to make sure that the, the, the integrity of the, the event that is to, to build opportunities for LGBTQ people to play sports uh, is, is still 
the, the focus of the event while also maintaining the opportunity for anybody to play in it. That's good to hear. Yeah, because I agree with you that, you know what, it, on one hand, you don't want to discriminate and say just because you're uh, you know heterosexual, you're not allowed to play. But on the other hand, it's like you said, it's about giving opportunities to people to feel comfortable, to people to be able to participate that might not be able to participate in other leagues or feel comfortable enough to participate, participate in other leagues. So I think that does make sense, and I think it's a good rule. It, it, it's, it's been an evolution over the last 15 years, and I, I, I like where it's ended up. You can have as many non-LGBTQ people on the team as you want, but on the field at any time, you can't have more than three. And, and, and I think that is, it's been a good compromise between the people who want to totally open it up and the people who, who want you know, just uh, to, to, yeah, to maintain those opportunities for people in the community. What's your thoughts about the promotional artwork? The uh, how the L is. Uh, uh. <laughs> I'll tell I'll tell you I'll tell you how that came about. So if you look at the flag football, um, uh, the, the so the L in flag is kind of slashed out with I think a rainbow flag, and that came from the kind of it was 2005. We were starting the New York Gay Flag Football League, and it was me and five other people. And we were going around New York City trying to find some bars to sponsor teams, and we were just kind of sitting around talking about marketing opportunities. And one of the guy who was heading up our marketing initiative just kind of threw out there this idea that it's kind of funny that flag football, if you just take out the L in flag, it says something kind of very different. And, and, and we all got, uh, we all thought it was funny. You know, that word, that word can mean a lot of things. Uh, one of the things is really, 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 really horrible. But it's said by gay men to one another in a fun, joking manner. It just doesn't have that horrible, horrible feeling that it does when somebody approaches you in a bar and screams it at you in, in a hateful manner. So we thought that it was a fun play on the word. And, uh, you know, I... I well, Seth is not LGBTQ, the, the director and producer. He's, you know, he, he's as close as a straight guy could get. So that he decided to, to, to call it that and use use uh, that in the artwork, I, I certainly don't have a problem with it. I think it's kind of a, a fun play on the word. But again, no one should ever use that word in a, in a mean, hateful manner. That is never appropriate. How was uh, Seth... Was he uh, pretty open-minded to, uh, you know, ideals, or did he uh, kind of go in and he knew what he was wanting to shoot and had you all adjust accordingly? It's Seth's movie. You know, I, I think that he, he had certain uh, people that he wanted to follow. He had certain storylines, and he also adapted. I mean, he, he, he lucked. Well, I guess he lucked out, but he also, he, he knew what he was doing. I, I'm not even going to say he lucked out. The fact the teams, the three teams that he chose, were very three very different teams. One was, you know, a lot of fun. One was just completely focused on the on-field stuff and winning. And my LA team, uh, because I moved from New York to LA, was the most dysfunctional team I've ever been a part of in any sport or any setting in my life. And and he picked some really good personalities to be the stars of the team and you know it's not not surprising two of those three teams end up doing very very well so i you know seth came in with with a particular perspective he knew who we wanted to follow and i think that i think that how good the movie came out is just is in large part because seth did some research knew what he was doing and knew how to craft a story what was the biggest transition like uh from new york to la on that team so I, I started the New York team. We played in four Gables. We finished third in the first one, and then we won the next three. And uh, coming to Los Angeles, you know, Los Angeles won the first two Gables. I, I was a, a, a captain of the team then. So coming back to L.A., the, the biggest thing was the change in hunger. When you win three straight championships, it, it's hard to continue to motivate people. And I, when I was the captain of the New York team, I 
talked to various coaches in other sports at different levels, college, high school. How do you motivate a team that has been successful? And they gave me some tips, and and and, and those things work. But at some point, your 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 bag of tricks just kind of wears out. When I came to LA, the players here said, "You just tell us to jump, and we'll we'll just say how high." They, they did absolutely everything that I asked with no questions. And so that was a just a very because because they were so hungry to win, that was a big change. So that was the biggest thing is just you know uh, in New York naturally through success people take leadership roles and 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 your um your fingerprints on the team fade away, which is, which is okay, but that was the biggest change that in LA I was just kind of given the keys to the kingdom and people said just you just tell us what to do, and and so as a as a as a leader in sports, that's a it's a it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure, um, but it, it's all it also presented a, a lot of opportunity. At that time, obviously, you know those two teams were the the biggest ones in the sport. Who currently is the uh, the dominant teams? Well, it's. I guess San Diego team uh, has, has won five in a row, five champions in a row, and then this year uh, they lost in the semifinals in Washington, D.C. won. What's interesting is that there have been, I think, 18 Gables, and only five cities have ever won. Uh, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, uh, San Diego, and Washington, D.C. So, and, and Chicago only won one. The rest of them all won at least three. So, I mean, the, 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 the four cities that are just kind of always there are D.C., L.A., San Diego, and, and New York. And every once in a while, Salt Lake City will sneak into a final. But I think those are just those are the four perennial powerhouses that everybody has to contend with. So are you the Tom Brady? Are you the Bill Russell? Are you the Michael Jordan? Which one? Because uh, obviously you're one of the all-time greats in this sport, being a Hall of Famer. You know, I, 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 con- I contributed, I think, a lot when I was playing I, to the organization of it and, and the promotion of it. And I think I brought a lot of interesting things on the field. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, I was never the most athletic person, but I, I studied the game. And I focused on the X's and O's and how to motivate people and how to how to coach people. And you know, I think there are three players, and 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 until this year, one of the three of us had been and had won every single championship: Wade Davis in New York, Eric Reisner in San Diego, and me. And between the three of us, we won twelve straight or something like that championships or ten straight. So, uh, I. It's 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 uh, it was always a nice mental exercise to get out on the field. The physical aspect was great, but it really was the mental exercise. And I think that the three of us brought the reason that we were successful is we brought a lot of football knowledge and and football acumen, and and that's why we were successful. Do you feel there are going to be other sports that'll have similar leagues like this? They all do. Uh, they, they, there's a uh, international basketball, international soccer, um, uh, swimming, uh, tennis, volleyball, softball. The softball, the, so- the the gay softball World Series. Just the men's side has like 150 to 200 teams every year, and that's not including all of the the other I don't know thousand teams that would like to go, but but just can't. So, uh, you know, all of the sports uh, have. I think I can't think of a sport that does not have some kind of LGBTQ national or international league at this point. So like you were saying earlier, it does feel like there are a lot more opportunities now than there had been in the past uh, for uh, LGBT uh, players and athletes. The way sports are today, high school, college, and the professional level, it is hard to, to find uh, a, a, a gay or bisexual or queer or lesbian athlete who has been rejected by their team. Now, certainly there are certain high school or college teams where religion, they're, they're from religious institutions and that plays a whole other, that plays a whole other role in their school policies. But 
if you just talk to gay athletes, you know, for example, let's take football. We know of at least seven openly gay men in in college football today. Several of them in major Division One schools: at University of Arizona, Kansas State, Air Force Academy. All of them report total acceptance by their teams. So, less and less today do we does the community quote unquote need these opportunities of, of for uh, that LGBT sports leagues provide because. We have a, such an increasing uh, support and, and access uh, in other leagues that doesn't diminish the need for the social aspect of those leagues. It's, it's nice to just go play sports with a bunch of gay guys. Like, I, I, it's just like straight guys like to sometimes just go play sports with a bunch of straight guys. So I think that it, the, the important part of these leagues is the social aspect. But more and more today, we, we have broad access to sports that we never did. If uh, fans are wanting to follow you on social media, that kind of thing, and find out more about the league, find out more about the, the bowl, where is the best place to do that at? Uh, well, you can go to Twitter um, at NGFFL. Uh, and they're also on, I think, at Gay Football. So you can follow either of those. But uh, NGFFL is the main one. And then you can go on to Facebook. Uh, I think if you just type in NGFFL, the National Gay Flag Football League, you should show up. Excellent. And just final thoughts on why people need to see this documentary and what's it like being the star of it? Well, I've, I've never been a movie star before, but... <laughs> um, well, I think, the, I think the best reason to see it is because it's entertaining. You know, it, the reason to see any film is, are there interesting characters? Is there an interesting storyline? Is the story told well? And I think it has the, all, all three of those things. You, you walk away from the movie loving some of the characters and hating some of them. You'll hopefully by the end be cheering for a team to win or not to win. Uh, I certainly did. So I think that's the best reason that it's just, Seth created an, an, an entertaining documentary. The, 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 the social responsibility elements of it are, are, are certainly lovely, and, it, and, and it's great to expose people more and more to the athleticism and strength of, of LGBTQ people, but the most important reason to see it is it's entertaining. Thank you, Sid, for being on the show today. Thank you.